Hello. I'd like to uh, take a few minutes, just highlighted kind of ways of approach to uh, chapters three and four of Moustakas. Um, I have Prof's notes for chapter three, and I just posted uh, Prof's notes for chapter four. And uh, so there is a, a more um, elaborated uh, presentation on those two chapters, and of course you have the chapters themselves in Moustakas's book. And I've also posted um, the second assignment on ethnomethodology. So let's think a minute about what we're up to here in this uh, phenomenological transcendental phenomenological method. And that does not come trippingly off the tongue. And that is that um, uh, we have an advantage in that as social scientists uh, doing qualitative research, sociologists, um, we can't see what we're wanting to understand. I mean by that, the social phenomena are not as visible to us. Uh, we have to uh, find ways of creating uh, opportunities for the uh, indicators of the presence of those phenomena to appear to us. That's what assignment one was all about. That's what chapter five in detail in the method is about in Moustakas. It is the epoche, sort of clearing your mind of any preconceptions, uh, removing the darkness from looking through a glass darkly getting the glass clear and then looking at the phenomenon in front of you and reducing down to where you see it and I mean as in italicize see it and then allow your imaginary variation to begin imagining what that phenomenon might be allowing the structures of that phenomenon to appear if we think of it in terms of the terminology that could be a noema uh, what we see out there as a a group of people will define it as a particular kind of group, which may not be the way it is at all, but that noema, and then our, the, um, the noetic is our um, idea of what that is and what structures we see and, and perhaps we place on it in order to make sense of it. But it may not be the structure that we see that we place on it that is the structure of a noema or the phenomenon itself. So the trick in qualitative methods is to disabuse ourselves of our, shall we say, our own noetic, noematic, uh, matic, uh, perception and allow that phenomenon to appear uh, in its own right. And then, then, through imaginative variation, look, search out the structures of that phenomenon not by our definition, but those that are indigenous to the phenomenon of the noema itself. It's kind of like in, uh, I think it was in chapter three. Um, yes, I put that optical illusion. Um, you know, these two optical illusions, uh, what is this? And uh, what is this? Is this a face or is it two faces looking at one another? You know. Um, is this a young woman looking away, or is it an older woman looking off to the side? Um, in a way, what would these? In a way, social phenomena, because they're not frogs in the sense of physical presences that we can taste, touch, smell, and all that kind of stuff. These social phenomena, because they're invisible, they have a sort of an optical illusion flavor to them. You may see them one way; I might see them another way. You and I, as outside researchers coming into a situation, may see them one way, and the people that are in the phenomenon and in the noema may see it another way. And um, so the, the trick is for you and I, as qualitative researchers, to realize there's an optical illusion possibility, and that we have to clear ourselves so that we're not seeing it in an illusion from our side, as researchers, but we're seeing it in the way that the people in that phenomenon are seeing it. So I think that's, uh, you know, these things are fun anyway, but I think they're very, uh, very apropos to the conversation we're having about the noema that you and I see maybe in an optical illusion and not anywhere like that. The noema of those that are embedded inside it, how they see it. Remember we talked last time I think about from the outside looking in, it's a boundary. And what we try and do is permeate that or make it in a way that we can get into that boundary and see it. But we're not part of the, we're not part of the inside. It'll always be strange to us. We'll be strangers in a strange land no matter how hard we work at it. There'll always be some strangeness. If we're on the inside looking out, then that's a horizon. 
very different way of looking, very different sense of the presence of that uh, noema, shall we say, from the inside looking out as a horizon, than us from the outside looking in. We bump up against the wall, the boundary of the noema, and then try and figure out how to get inside and see it for how it really is. And it ain't an easy thing. It takes practice. Um, the other thing, uh, I think, uh, and uh, perhaps it was notes four, could have been notes two, uh, forgive me, where we were looking at intentionality and the trees. We were using uh, Pierre Mondrian's trees as an illustration of, um, and I think Moustakis uses the tree as an example or one of the references that he talks about in that chapter, one of those chapters talks about trees. When we look at a tree, um, are we seeing the actual tree? Are we seeing our impression, shall we say? Are we seeing the noema of the tree? If I see the tree from this angle and you see the tree from this angle, probably we're seeing the same tree, but the noema, your noema of that tree and my noema of that tree is very different. Our uh, noetic structures may be similar because we mean trees are trees are trees are trees perhaps, and we're looking at it from different perspectives. So uh, intentionality then if the other thing that we, when we're doing this, is that we haven't, if we are talking in a social context with co-researchers, as we talk about them, and Moustakas, people in the community, in that uh, group, you know, maybe it's a neighborhood or something who are trying to do some stuff related to community health. Um, the intentionality, our intention, how we see it, is another way of characterizing our noetic look. Uh, we see, no, I won't say italicized, we see it. But do we really see it? These differences are subtle, but they're very important. We want to see italicized eyes is the way we want to be qualitative researchers and practitioners. If our intentionality produces something in front of us that is not the, shall we say, true presentation of that phenomenon to the people that are in it, then we've missed the point. So we, the issue then becomes when we have qualitative discussions, as we're talking about, I'm on the outside boundary, you're on the inside horizon, because we probably wouldn't use those words, but have conversations that would enable us to become more closely related to the co-researcher's perspective. L opening our ears and listening to their voice. Uh, not with our intentionality and construction, not with our structure, noetic structure on that, but allowing that noema, if you will, from their standpoint to appear to us and that we're seeing it from the inside in its horizons and not the outside in its boundary. Okay, uh, we could go on and on, on about this for a long while. Uh, take a look at those notes and um, all that theme is elaborated in there. Let's talk about the assignment that's coming up. Now what we did with assignment one, the epouché, the reduction, imagining variation was a practice, something you want to always do. And you know, in a lot of ways we do do that. You and I as social scientists probably, we like to watch people in groups who are sitting in a mall. We probably sit there and we see a group of people off in a corner somewhere having a conversation. We get curious and imagine what they might be doing and what's the dynamic of them and all that sort of thing. So we sort of clear our minds. We don't just assume it's a family or something. We play around with it a little bit to try and better understand what they're doing by watching their interaction then, then provide us a sense of the structure of that interaction. So imaginatively in our variation we get a better view from the internal dynamic of what that noema phenomenon of that engagement of that group is. Um, so that's one way and always a constant way that we want to approach even if you're going into a neighborhood to talk about community health uh, you want to clear the darkness of the glass and see it as if it were for the first time and allow it to appear to you um, I think the uh, ethnomethodology is something different in the sense that it, it accomplishes the same thing but it's a breach it's a very interesting kind of way. Like if you are walking down the hallway and you've got the noema and the noetic uh, of friendship with uh, Bob coming down the hallway, then um, you know that that noema is friendship and you and he are pretty corresponding in your noetic. You know what the structure is. So it's just an automatic assumption. Hey Bob, hey Steve. Well you go down the hallway and Bob goes right by you and says nothing to you. 
like he wouldn't even see you. You know, I would go, what? You know, uh, I've been breached. <coughs> the noema that he and I have, we share that horizon of friendship. It's been breached. And so suddenly it comes to the forefront and I can see it. And then I, you know, I may turn around, hey, Bob, what's up? You know, why, how, how come you diss me, man? What is going on here? Uh, so sometimes we go through this everydayness navigation of our lives and we don't think about the underlying principles and rules of behavior and navigating that because they're just taken for granted, everydayness. And we don't often realize it until it's breach. Somebody, in this case, Bob dissing me or, uh, you know, maybe, um, you know, a more significant event, uh, a death in the family changes the feature of the family brings the for, to the forefront the noema of the family and, um, and you're already in the horizon because you're a member of the family and you can sense the change that's going on and even if you're on the outside of the family and you're at the funeral at the graveside and you're uh, the burial ceremony and you look at the family you can see that there's a change going on uh, not that they're disintegrating although there, might, there could be that kind of thing happening people just falling apart uh, so there are all kinds of breaches, some serious, some not so serious. If you're standing in line uh, at uh, the movie theater, there's line behavior. Nobody, there's no, sometimes there's a sign up there stand in a single line, but you know, generally we know that's the case, that that's what we do, at least in our culture. And um, if you're standing in line and the person in front of you, it gets crowded and they back up and they sort of get into your space, well you back up and then you back up into somebody behind you and then they back up, uh, there's a breach going on there. I mean, ordinarily, hardly ever anymore in this crazy, uh, dense society, when we extend our arms out to the tips of our fingers, that diameter uh, is pretty much our personal space. Don't get inside that space, you know? So, uh, but, you know, when we're out in society, grocery stores and movie theaters, airlines, airports, uh, airplanes, man, it's like this kind of space, right? We feel, uh, we feel encroached upon. Sometimes that's breached and you, you feel uncomfortable in a crowd perhaps because of that. You feel closed in. Uh, somebody bumping into you in line behavior. If you're standing there and somebody, eight people in front of you cuts in line, you know, that's a breach. You know, you might shout out, hey, get in the back of the line or something. There are a lot of uh, unintentional, well, that would be an intentional, a lot of breaches that we can see happening, like uh, line behavior, somebody cutting in line. There are breaches that we might do unintentionally, sort of inadvertently. We might uh, be really preoccupied as I'm going down the hallway, Bob's coming this way, and I don't even see him, you know, because uh, I'm caught up in some the, something else. I inadvertently breach that, uh, the phenomena of that noema. So ethnomethodology is about breaching. It's about observing inadvertent or intentional breaches out there in the world and looking at the assumptions of what what is breach what is the phenomenon what is the noema that has been breached and um, and then explore in your mind what are the um, what are the values why does that noema exist why do we have line behavior um, just take a look at ethnomethodology another way um, not the more um, contemplative way shall we say of the um, epoche and reduction to uh, imaginary variation, but a more action-based, ethnomethodological breach uh, that we can do, and I ask you to do one or not. Um, you know, the classic one is getting in an elevator and uh, going to the back of the elevator and facing the back wall, rather than turning around towards the door. Uh, you do that and you'll, uh, you're likely to make people uncomfortable. So much so, if they're on their way to the fifth floor, when it stops on the fourth floor, they're going to get off. I mean, you, when you, if you do any intentional breaches as part of this, you want to be respectful. Uh, if you do a breach, you want to clarify with somebody after you've done it, why you've done it. And um, you don't want to, um, you know, breach somebody morally or even unethically. I mean, uh, play with the breaches a little bit, you know. If you're sitting at the table with your mother, and um, you decide to uh, eat your peas with a knife or a, uh, something like that, and that will breach your, your mother, that's for sure. And she's likely to say something, say, oh, Mom, I'm just, just checking you out. It's part of a class exercise. A lot of little things that you can do. Um, keep them on the fun level. Don't get too serious out there. Don't, get any, don't create any hostility. 
but uh, ethno methodology is a very effective way uh, for bursting, shall we say, breaking apart uh, a noema. All right, so that's for today. I'll uh, I'll put a uh, prof's notes out on chapter five, and I'm not sure I'll get to six and seven, but chapter five next week, and um, another video. Um, I, uh, I'll be looking at later today and over the weekend the assignments that you posted for assignment one and uh, so I thank you for that. Uh, this is Friday. I don't mind admitting it. Y'all have a, uh, a good weekend and talk to you next week. Be safe.